So this is Next Matters Most, which is, you know, a podcast about uh, technology, business, entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. um, you know, and kind of in my, and you, we've know each other a little bit. So like kind of in my journey and my business, we're tech, tech focused, work with a lot of entrepreneurs who are always trying to solve problems, think about, you know, future problems, how to skate to where the puck's going or whatever. And so, you know, Next Matters Most has always been something that we've used or we've tried to embed into our mindset like what's next in healthcare what's next in fintech just whatever um it's a nice large umbrella and so i thought hey this would be a great content series to go out and reach out to my network and, and cover lots of stuff so i've already been talking to people about education and technology healthcare um you know well-being and wellness emotional wellness um and I was thinking about you for a while. I was like, man, you've got all these things going on and politics and culture and Durham. And there's a lot about that that's important as we think about how we think about our next steps and what's next as, you know, in that, in that field. And, and that was important three months ago too. And, and it's what I've sort of learned and what smacked me in the face, which is why I didn't, you know, great pause this podcast is like, that was cool to be like, Hey, this is next. And we're like going someplace. But then a lot of these events that have unfolded over the last few months, have really got us to focus on, we need to start doing more of a lot of stuff now. And so it hasn't necessarily been what's next. It's about like, let's think about what's next, but let's look at today and today, what actions can we start taking today and tomorrow to get ourselves in a position to, to be successful and to be thriving, to be flourishing, to be a healthy population, healthy culture, health, healthy civilization, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's been a really interesting, you know, silver lining of, uh, of what's going on. So that's, that's kind of it. So there's no like, you know, one specific track to stay on. It's kind of, let's go wherever you, you want to go, but um, mm -hmm. maybe start with, give us the, the elevator pitch of, of Pierce Freelon and kind of, <laughs> you're working on and this uh yeah just let just let me know let the audience know about about you and what you're up to okay sure um well thanks for having me on um i consider myself an afrofuturist so to 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 be on a show that's about visioning and shaping and talking about the future is like right in my bag and um you know for me i, I don't know how i could um, condense my multitudes into an elevator pitch. Um, and I, I think that I'm not saying that to be braggadocious. I think we're all that complicated and unique. Um, but we are, you know, encouraged to offer ourselves in a, you know, in a, in a, in an elevator sized container, which is, you know, the equivalent of like a happy meal bag. It's like, here's my, <laughs> here's my LinkedIn, here's my, tra here's the trailer, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's hard to get to the, you know, the complexity of all that we are in, in those contexts. Um, but uh, I'm involved in, in quite a few spaces in, um, I would say there's maybe three or four overarching areas where my work uh, intersects. Um, one of the core ones is is the is the creative realm, where I'm um, uh, a maker. I'm a musician, a filmmaker, director. Um, working on a couple projects right now. I'm working on a children's album called Dad, um, and uh, that I've written and produced. I'm also about on the Fourth of July. I'm working on a, an animated series right now called The History of White People in America. It is, uh, was selected by Whoopi Goldberg to the um, Tribeca Film Festival. It's a film that really talks about the origins of race. Uh, the first time the word white appeared in a, in a legal document uh, in this country was in the 1600s. And so we obviously still live with the legacy of, of race as a social construct. And it has all types of implications for folks politically, socially, culturally. Um, but, you know, this idea started somewhere. It was born somewhere. And in this country, it has ties back to some rebellions, uh, some class rebellions in the 1600s. So anyway, we, uh, we chose the medium of animation to tell that story. 
uh, and I wrote and composed the score uh, with uh, another producer and musician and sound engineer based out of uh, Chapel Hill named Aaron Keene. So, um, so that creative hat, you know, directing, uh, filmmaking, you know, webcasting, um, or I guess not webcasting, but I created a web series called Beat Making Lab. That, that's kind of one hat that I wear. Um, another one of my hats uh, is in academia. Um, as a professor for about 11 years, I've been teaching in the Department of African and African American and Diaspora Studies at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, I've also taught in the music department at UNC and in the uh, political science department at North Carolina Central University. So a big part of what I do in addition to the creative is, uh, you know, that, that kind of scholarly work and, and kind of mentoring the, our next generation of young thinkers. And uh, kind of, I guess I would put that under the banner of, yeah, academia or teaching, educating others. Um, also, I, I run a community center called Black Space where I teach and mentor youth. That's where we connected, uh, was through Black Space um, and making sure that our kids are, are well equipped to step into the future with all the tools that they'll need is from coding to digital storytelling to, um, you know, to uh, 3D printing. So we do that at Black Space and I also do that at UNC. And the third hat, I would say is politics. And um, I've been involved uh, doing movement work and um, arts activism and organizing work for probably 15 or more years here in Durham actively. Um, I ran for mayor in 2017, ran for state senate this last election cycle. Um, and um, I sit on the board of the, um, or the, the Durham Human Relations Commission and, and other boards doing social justice work. Um, so, and I've done, and I've worked in various other intersecting comp capacities. For example, like um, I was on the board of the Statewide Arts Council, um, which is a political appointment. The governor appoints you to that board, but it's doing cultural work, which I was, already doing and then I teach culture as a professor. So, you know, the, the Venn diagram of my world has lots of intersecting bubbles, but, um, you know, and clearly I'm long winded, <laughs> but uh, if I were to condense it down to three, it would probably be, uh, yeah, culture, politics, and uh, academia. Yeah, no, that's great. Well, I mean, there's clearly, you know, some kind of thread that like weaves through them all. So, I mean, you've got kind of, uh, you've got a story, a perspective, an ability to tell that, and you're, you're doing that through the production, you know, and the creative, through the conveying and, and inspiring in academia, and then politics is hopefully influencing others through maybe a higher level, you know, of policy even. So I think that, well, that was equally not like totally buttoned up, but I think there's definitely, you know, a, a a thread that you can weave through, through that whole story in terms of the, the Venn diagram. What's um, what's going on with politics right now? I guess I was on the site. Is that, that was, I guess, last cycle? And then is there anything coming up for this new election that you're a part of or? Yeah, I mean, I'm, uh, so the, yeah, my primary was in March. I, haven't, I was actually emailing my brother to reroute my website, um, like right before this call. Um, uh, he's he's a, a web guy, digital guru. He's also a professor in the communications department, um, Dr. Dean Freelon, my older brother. But anyway, um, yeah, so that, that uh, by the time this goes live, my website will probably direct towards my next project, which is um, the children's album that I'm working on. Uh, in terms of politics, um, you know, there I, I'm keeping my ear to the street and and trying to stay connected to the uh, mass movements of folks who are calling for justice right now um, with the um, murder of George Floyd and and many others at the hands of police and uh, white supremacist vigilantes. Um, 
I, I'm not sure yet how that, if or how that will translate into a future run for political office. But, um, you know, my, my activism and, and my political engagement has never been uh, tethered to any particular office. It's been about uh, how can I, thinking through how I can leverage my gifts to be of service to my community. And I was born and raised here in Durham. Um, you know, in 2017, that meant stepping up to run for mayor after Bill Bell retired. Um, he had been the mayor since I was in high school. And when he finally stepped down, you know, after really transforming the city, um, there was a vacuum. And so that was a, a moment where I felt uh, a millennial voice was needed. You know, when our city council had a median age of 65, and, and our, our city has a median age of 30, and there was nobody in their 30s uh, holding public office in Durham. So that was a moment where I felt uh, compelled to step up um, and to represent uh, for my city and to come with some innovative policies that I didn't hear some of our elders uh, talking about. Uh, and same for state Senate, we had a, a great incumbent, um, uh, Senator Floyd McKissick, who who uh, was moving on to the Utilities Commission, and it was another kind of unique opportunity for me to step up. Um, so, you know, I, I'm definitely going to play things by ear. I'm I'm remaining involved, but but again, my 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 political engagement right now is about uplifting the voices of uh, marginalized Black communities, which have been suffering under the 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 knee of white supremacy and police brutality. Um, and, and I've been doing that work, um, you know, uh, but, but right now it's kind of a critical, um, you know, um, uh, what do you call that? Uh, it's, it's reached a critical mass because of the times that we're in with COVID-19 and, and, and the way that um, the uh, escalating assault on black lives has, has created this uh, mass movement uh, where people are hitting the streets. And so we've been doing our part um, as Black Space, as a board member of North Star, and as a member of the uh, Human Relations Commission to amplify those voices and to, uh, and to try to address some of the very pressing issues that are facing cities across the country as it relates to police brutality. Yeah, I will come back to that. But how, you know, this is probably just as easy as putting yourself into an elevator pitch box. But, you know, what's kind of your DNA and your story and, and what what's gotten to you to this point in terms of, you know, knowing your your story or the things that have given you inspiration to, to create and, and drive all this cultural cultural content first and then with your content you're spreading it through the academia the black space and then you know through politics and, and advocation and all that but how before this moment and some as of now yeah i mean if we put all your bio stuff in a link like it's a it's a large novel and you're pretty inspirational for people and i think there's a I, I would think that it would be hard for someone to be like, how could I ever be like that? That's just crazy. There's so much going on in the Pierce Freelon ecosystem that that just is like superhuman. But, you know, back up, like how, I mean, you went to, you grew up here, you went to school, you had experiences. Like, I don't know what, what, what kind of, what's, give us some details on, on that story and what led to inspiration and how you kind of got this, this ball rolling. Sure. Well, um, I have to give credit to my parents and my ancestors and my community for shaping the man that I've become. Um, I'm 36 and uh, my story is not remarkable or unobtainable for anybody who, um, you know, uh, well, granted, there are, there are certain privileges that I grew up with. Um, I think the biggest privilege was uh, being connected to my ancestors. And I think that, um, you know, when I got to college and I was able to, to study uh, how white supremacy and uh, work to kind of oppress uh, and control the minds of, of Africans living in America 
a lot of it, the first thing that they did was they tried to erase your memory of your ancestors, you know, and they did that by doing things like taking your name away. So you may have had an African name or, an Af or, or a religion or, or a cultural context that drew you back and connected you to the, your ancestors. Uh, and then you kind of step foot on this soil that is not yours, um, is unfamiliar, and they take away your name, they take away your language, um, and they take away your identity and your power. Um, and for hundreds of years, you know, Black folks weren't able to read, they weren't able to vote, they weren't able to, we weren't able to, uh, you know, to practice. In some places, we weren't able to drum. You know, there were things that were uh, institutionalized to try to brainwash us out of our out of our power, and so for me, I, I think uh, it was a huge privilege to grow up um, in a household and in a community that was really connected to their ancestral legacies and their power, and uh, that that was certainly the case in our household where I had a grandmother who was very. Uh, adamant that we um, understand and recognize and praise and celebrate our ancestors, but also the city of Durham. Like, um, there's a proud legacy of Black entrepreneurship here that goes back to the um, to the beginning of the uh, you know late 19th, early 20th century with Black Wall Street. The first Black-owned bank was in Durham. First Black-owned insurance company in the world was here in Durham, um, in the Western world at least. Um, we certainly had uh, plenty of institutions uh, prior to imperialism and colonialism, but, um, you know, Durham was unique in the United States. And let me say in the country, uh, first black owned insurance company and bank. Um, you know, we, we have, uh, the. I used to grow up going to the Haytai Heritage Center, um, you know, an institution that um, was named after the Haitian Revolution. Haytai was like a a homonym with Haiti. And so they, they were calling themselves uh, the Haiti community because uh, that was a community of folks who liberated themselves from slavery. Um, and so that, that legacy, that history, uh, the, the, the legacy of uh, White Rock Baptist Church, uh, where Martin Luther King came to speak, where W.E.B. Du Bois 100 years ago came to Durham to talk about uh, how unique this place was uh, to be in the South during segregation and to have such a thriving uh, metropolis for Black life and entrepreneurship. So, you know, in North Carolina Central University, there are all these institutions that reminded me of who I was and, and really gave me tools to see uh, the value in my, um, you know, and, and, and the worth that I carried within myself and is a part of my lineage, my legacy, and, and is my birthright and inheritance. And so um, I, I really, when I think back, I, I really cherish that I was able to have that culturally affirming environment to grow up in, uh, especially in a culture that was kind of built off, uh, you know, slavery and white supremacy, as we're seeing now with the kind of mass movements um, you know, it's, it's, it's important to acknowledge that white supremacy isn't just a thing that happens when a police officer is kneeling on a, on a, on a person, on a black man's neck. It's something that happens in the classroom when you don't, when you don't hear uh, from authors that are African American or that are Chinese or that are, um, you know, queer or that are women. Um, what happens is you don't you don't see. Uh, there's a, a woman that once said, um, "You can't be what you don't see." Um, you know, so if you don't see any women entrepreneurs or LGBTQ entrepreneurs or Black entrepreneurs, um, you know, or doctors or or um, you know founders, um, it's hard to envision yourself occupying that seat. And that was certainly the case for my dad, who was an architect. He grew up not, not knowing any black architects. And it wasn't until college where he was able to do his research that he found that Julian Abel, for example, uh, from Philly, where my dad is from, was the architect that designed most of Duke University, including Duke Chapel, um, at a time uh, in the early 1900s when it was illegal for him to step foot on campus because of segregation. 
Um, so it's not that those it's not that those accomplished black architects and engineers and city planners weren't there. They were just kind of invisibilized. But for my dad, you know, who who himself went on to be a, a, a an innovative leader in the field of architecture um, and was the architect of the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture, um, you know, you're kind of, uh, it's, it's really remarkable that he was able to achieve what he did without any examples to look at that, that reflected his culture. Um, and so I, I had him as a role model to look up to in terms of uh, being able, and, and I think a lot of not just Afrofuturism, but just looking into what's next, it's about using your creative imagination to, um, to project what isn't there yet. You need to be able to see the problem and, and anticipate, you know, solutions, um, you know, that, that don't exist yet. And, and that requires a create, that requires imagination. You know, you have to be able to wrap your mind around a future that doesn't exist yet. And uh, I would say every, every great social justice activist has done just that. They've looked at an institution like slavery and they've said, you know what? We may never have for generations have never have known what freedom looks like, but we are going to envision it and we're going to do whatever we can strategically to manifest it. Um, and, uh, and that work is not only an extension of my humanity, wanting to create a better life for myself and my family, but it's also, it has all these other residual impacts. It's great for business. It's great for the economy. It's great for our moral fiber, you know, but it comes from people just wanting to create uh, a better situation for themselves. And that that rising tide lifts all ships. Everyone's life is improved when um, when those who are uh, oppressed do the labor of um, uh, shaping a better world for all of us. Um, and so that's what people in Durham have historically done. And uh, that's what my ancestors have done. And for me, that 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 was a huge part of how I came into the type of work that I do. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, that was amazing. Um, and, you know, I heard a bunch of stuff there that I wanted to comment on. Um, it, it, I mean, in one of which is, you know, knowing, like, I mean, you said, like, connected to your ancestors, like, it's connected to your power. And we talk about that, like knowing your story. <clears throat> I have a global, I mean, not a global theme or trend, but a lot of the stuff that you said, you know, I don't want, I have this thought, I'm not sure the best way to like polish this up, but like the, the racial conversations that are being front and center now are, are different, but shouldn't be seen as different than like healthcare conversations and health equity shouldn't be different than mental health and mental health conversations like these aren't competing we're all trying to move together as a better society as a better population and i feel like you know when we can talk about you know i like i think if we all are working together on the same thing it's like look if 10 people are all working on their own ideas are we going to get as much movement as we will if all of the 10 of these best people work on the same idea you know what has the most impact and so when i see that i'm like man there's you know, there's so much of this that's that you're saying and that you're doing and practicing that's inspirational for like all youth or all entrepreneurs or all society transcending the work that you're doing kind of in the African American community. Does that make sense? Like, yeah, sure. Which to me is like, shit, that's so eye opening and that's sort of an untapped. You hear narratives on the TV or on radio, like, and it can feel it can feel like it's a, like a f fixed pie. And so more effort goes into here, it's coming away from something else. It's like, well, that's not true. We're creating a bigger pie and a better mm -hmm. pie kind of in the future. And so like, mm -hmm. but like knowing your power, that's huge. There's so many 
young people or kids or entrepreneurs or any humans, middle-aged people, I'm 39, like that if you don't know, if you're not connected to your own power, you, you, you're like anchorless. Mm -hmm. And that could be anyone across anything. And I'm not going to take away from, you know, the, the, the piece on, on race. And this isn't to like make this like, oh, it's all equal. It's not. I don't mean that. And there's a lot of other privilege that goes along with other things too. But there is a global message about knowing your own story and getting connected to your power that anchors you in, in something. And it gives, you know, when you talk about, uh, you know, I was, a good friend of mine, Don Azevedo, was on the this, and, and we talk about kind of emotional wellness, and mm -hmm. it's, you know, your fulfillment and your ability to flourish is way more than just like an accomplishment sure. or a success or hitting a goal. I mean, it's everything. It's, you know, it, it's all these other pieces that, that give us purpose and positive emotional relationships and engagement. Uh, accomplishments are on it, but like just winning isn't shit if you come home and you, yeah. there's no one there. So it's like, it's all of these things. And I think there's a huge, huge thread. And so that, and you, you know. Well, you, you, you brought up something that, that I want to, I want to expand upon a little bit. Um, and Garrett, my, one of my favorite <laughs> entrepreneurial people that I look up to is Gary V. Do you know who that is? Gary yeah, 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 yeah. I watch his stuff all the time. He's great. But, um, and he talks about kind of knowing your power, knowing your story. You want to start a podcast, like. He advises people, you know, the most innovative thing you can do is be yourself. And yep. w with all your quirks is to find your voice. And, uh, you know, that's not a key to overnight success, but it is a key to, to happiness and to being able to build a strong foundation from which you can be successful. That's and right. when, you, when you say anchorless, uh, to me, I'm, you know, I'm a lyricist. And I think about metaphor a lot and so what is an anchor an anchor is a heavy ass piece of iron that keeps your ship from just going anywhere and uh and the vessel is a boat and in your metaphor of 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 finding your anchor your center you're the boat <laughs> and 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 your and an anchor is a is a vital tool in a boat if you don't have an anchor you can't traverse the tumultuous body uh, of of life you know the oceans of life and uh you know when you're out there just kind of floating around aimlessly then you, you don't have any you don't have any direction you don't have any agency maybe you do have direction imagine that let's say your sails all the boat is working fine but but you don't have an anchor um you're in trouble you know the other thing you need, though, in, in this metaphor, I think, is a compass. Um, you need an anchor and you need a compass. And this is something that my dad taught me. Um, you know, you need to know where you're going and where not to go. And that doesn't necessarily mean like, you know, the, the proverbial, like, what are you going to be when you grow up? Oh, I want to be a doctor. Great. You know, follow that trajectory. It's really more from an energy standpoint, like my dad was an architect, um, but he also had his values. That was his anchor and his compass. And when someone came and offered him an architectural job, would you like to design this prison? He said, hmm, I've been trained in how to design structures. I've been, I have the technical prowess to do this. I, I'm a, a, a work for hire. People hire me to build things. I need the money. I could use this commission, but because the value of what the prison industrial complex didn't align with his values of the world he wanted to create, he was able to look at that opportunity and say, no, I'm good. I'm not going to design prisons. Thank you for the offer. I'm not going to design casinos because I know addiction is a real thing and I don't want to pour my gifts into those types of institutions. That's a compass. He had his North Star, even without necessarily knowing where it would get him. It helped him discern between uh, projects that he wanted to take on and projects that he didn't want to take on. And, and so, uh, you know, he did schools instead. He did cultural centers instead. The first cultural center my dad ever designed was, was the, uh, in Chapel Hill, the, um, the Sonia Haynes Stone Center for African American History and Culture, first ever uh, cultural center. 
which led to other more work in that lane. Then he did the museum in, in Greensboro, the Civil Rights Museum, then the African American Center in Charlotte, you know, locally in the state, which led to other projects nationally, which led to the Smithsonian. And to me, that that's such a lesson because, you know, as an architect, you could do any, you could design anything. But if you don't have that core, you don't have that compass, and you don't have that idea of the roadmap where you want to go, and you don't have that anchor where you can plant yourself firmly in the midst of a storm and and you know, and weather the turbulent times when like COVID, when you have to lay off, you know, folks or, or, or change your business strategy to adapt to a crisis, you know, then what you are is, is susceptible to, to the winds of the time. Hmm. And that's not a place any of us want to be. We don't want to be so flimsy that we fall over. Uh, that's not to say that, that there won't be times when you know, your ship has to weather a storm. But uh, when you make it out on the other end of that, you know, get your duct tape together and put your sails up and, and, and keep moving towards the goal. And I think that, um, you know, your, your mentioning an anchor just made me think about that as a, as a really powerful metaphor um, for folks who are, in any line of work, I certainly see how it applies in my dad's case, uh, but I can, uh, uh, even just yesterday, I'm working with these two filmmakers. This guy reached out to me, a musician, a white guy. He was like, man, you know, I, I want to make a protest song, uh, or I've made a protest song a couple years ago. It feels very relevant. I want to shoot a video for it. Um, and he was asking me for advice. This was at a time when I was really kind of grieving and struggling with everything that's happening socially. And I was like, hey, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know how to answer all the questions you're asking because he asked, it was a long email. And I said, but I'll tell you what, um, something that would be helpful for black filmmakers and entrepreneurs right now, if you're trying to help folks in the movement, in addition to getting your message out there, would be to hire like some filmmakers of color you know, every filmmaker I know has been struggling because all their video shoots and projects have been canceled due to COVID. So I gave him some recommendations of some, uh, of some African Americans some queer and some women videographers for him to reach out to. And so uh, he reached out to this one duo, these two black women filmmakers. And I told them ahead of time, Hey, I'm sending you this guy, I referred him to you. And, and so, uh, they um, told me afterwards, after getting on a call with him, that they didn't feel like they were the right people for that project. And I know these filmmakers aren't rolling in dough right now and had a, had a bunch of gigs canceled. But I took a mental note of, okay, they've got a compass because they were able to see this project with money on the table, budget, ready to go. It was like a good cause, you know, for social justice, like, this could have been a good look, but they, they, they were choosing not to take that project for whatever reason. We didn't get into the details, but I took a mental note that they've got a, they've got a bright future ahead of them if they're able to discern with that level of scrutiny what type of projects fit their brand and which don't. Because um, some people would say, you know what, we're on hard times, let's do it you know, and, uh, and where that gets you um, may ultimately be necessary in the moment for you because you got to eat, you know, but uh, if you steer too far off course, you got to take the time to right the ship before you can continue, which, you know, may sometimes be necessary. But if you have the privilege to be able to say no, which as my grandmother said, and this is why I say my knowledge of my ancestors is power because I can quote my grandma and, I, and, and she got that quote probably from one of her ancestors. She said, no is a love word. Hmm. And that's, that's deep right there. Yep. They're saying no to him was an extension of love. Uh, we're not right for this project. No. Um, that was, it, it was an expression of self love. You're talking about kind of vulnerability and keeping your peace within your self and mental health so maybe it was a gesture for their own self-love but also for the client 
um, if I'm not right for this project, but I'm gonna do it anyway, I'm not gonna do it to the highest level that it's capable of being. And there might be a filmmaker out there that would be like Voltron, you know, or Sailor Moon, whatever, name your group of, you know, fighters that, that click really well. Jordan and Pippin, uh, your Pippin may be out there, um, you know, and, and by me saying no, you gotta keep looking and, and hopefully eventually you'll, you'll find the right fit. Um, so no is a love word is, is I think linked to having a compass uh, and, and knowing when to throw your anchor uh, in the ocean. Yeah, no, that's, I, I love metaphors too, even if they, I mean, they can never get off track, right? Because it's a metaphor. And so the compass, the North Star, knowing where you're going, I also think helps you build resilience. And that was one of the biggest things that was eye-opening to me personally about COVID at first. Mm was personally was i were we on a budget was i already in shape so that i could weather the storm of like ordering takeout to support the restaurants like no i was not or no was the answer to all these was i already had i already organized sort of my my business life in a way that i could take time off if i had to like not really i was working too hard i was out of shape we weren't really on a budget so it was like if things change, are we okay? I mean, the ultimate answer was yes. And especially relative to the world, super yes, right? Like many people have it way, way worse. But we were like, shit, we should have like been practicing, you know, having our compass knowing where we're going so that we had this resilience built up. Like what if I was already in shape and you can go order takeout a couple of weeks in a row and then just get back on track. But I was like, damn, man, we weren't, we weren't ready for that. Also, I mean, gosh, what about how that's an analog was the society ready for this to happen? No, we didn't have money in reserves to distribute to people. We're printing new money. We're going into more debt. Like we didn't have methods and modes to this issue communication or testing. Like we weren't resilient as a society. The George Floyd death, we aren't resilient as a society, as a culture. We weren't ready for that, or we weren't at a place where we were even able to, it's like a watershed moment. And I'm, and I'm still kind of like, I hope it is, and I, I believe it will be, and I want to get to that too and talk about, you know, ways we can work together as a community, but like, it's sad that it's a watershed moment, it's 2020, it's like, frankly, effed up, you know, like, man, that's still going on, so obviously, we haven't built up the resilience in communities and in between different groups and in between the people that advocate for social justice and the people that are the negative inflictors of social injustice in cases, the legal system, police, governments, mm -hmm. whatever. I mean, there's many parties on all sides, but like that wasn't built up. So now when one thing happens, you just see this like little tiny thing be like, you realize, oh my God, how systemic are these problems? And so that, and so, I mean, I think I'm speaking to the compass. I want to ask you about, you know, your compass and where you're going as an Afro futurist, what you see, where that compass is going to take you. Mm -hmm. and feel free to tie in and just to put a ribbon on the story part it's inspirational that you're sharing it. you've been so inspired by knowing your story knowing your power that you're you're materialized manifesting that through your creative and you're sharing that mm. with young people through academia i think that's awesome but yeah as you think about the future your compass as afro futurist and i mean feel free to lace us into kind of the george floyd situation like what is that future like? What is the future of getting to the other side where we're now a better society, a better human race? Yeah. And I'll just say that I'll be the first to say like, man, you get, you keep going back up a layer and back up a level and back up a level, back level, eventually it becomes unattainable. You know, you're like, and then you're like, shit, what should I do? And now you're lost, right? How do people, you talk, I don't keep talking, but I want to get to where like, what is an action we can take? Cause I can't go all the way to the top and unpack systemic stuff at a government behind closed doors level and i can't probably work do yeah. anything three or four levels down i can only do things the first few levels in front of me sure you know yeah yeah and 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 you shouldn't because it, it's really this is what it comes down to uh and this is what the future is um or should be <laughs> i guess we'll <laughs> but I like to speak things into existence. So we'll go, we'll stick with this. <laughs> yep. The future is um, giving uh, 
marginalized folks a seat at the table. Um, the future is distributing resources in a way that's equitable and, and giving power to the people to do that work that you're incapable of doing, as you accurately pointed out. You know, when you're benefiting from the structure that exists, how could you possibly be the one to, to suss out what issues uh, are, are creating the instability in the first place? That's not to say you don't have a role in, in fixing those issues, but the people who are best equipped to diagnose the situation are the folks uh, that are, are most oppressed or harmed by the systems and structures in place. But what the system that we have right now is such that those folks have the least power, the least voice, the least resources. And we need to flip that paradigm uh, so that we're somewhere more in the middle and that, um, that gives marginalized folks a seat at the table and some agency or they're just gonna take it <laughs> and uh uh you know and, and shape it without consent without the consent of the ruling class um you know that's what you're seeing with some of the breakdown of society as people call it it's an uprising it's an uprising it's an oppressed people rising up to take uh, what power is available to them. And it's not a lot. I mean, breaking a, a, the window of an Apple store and walking away with a device that they can track <laughs> and get back, you know, that's not a lot of power. That's peanuts. Um, you know, the destruction of public property that's insured, um, you know, that, that's, that is just venting. That is just uh, the, the, the Boston Tea Party, it's a, it's a, it's a, it is an expression of rage uh, about a system that is oppressing um, vulnerable people. And so, um, yeah, so I mean, the, the future, the solutions to these problems are in a, in a corporate academic term, diversity, <laughs> you know, is, is a big part of the solution. And I guess the other one would be kind of race equity and inclusion. There, there are certain terms floating around the business world that touch the tip of the iceberg of some of these things. But let's just talk from a policy standpoint. Um, you know, in city government, um, we don't need uh, fraternal police orders creating policies around policing. What we need is people from the hood who are, are under the knee of the officer's neck to be the ones telling cities how policing is most effective. If those people aren't in the room, we're gonna keep getting the same results that we've been getting. And, and it's so important that we uplift the voices and the stories of those people because human beings, we're emotional creatures, we're intellectual creatures, but we're emotional. Story is a powerful tool and technology in helping people understand and relate and, and shape change. That's what made King such a powerful figure is because of the way he was able to wield metaphor and tell story in such a way that moved people. Uh, and so I think one of my roles in my future with projects like History of White People, with spaces like Black Space, uh, even with this kids album, Dad, that I'm working on, it's really about storytelling. Um, so anyway, that's me. Getting back to my earlier point around shaping policy or changing you know, the culture of entrepreneurship, if we don't have those voices in the room from those marginalized communities, then not only are we not going to achieve the most equitable results, it's also we found and study after study shows this, it's bad for business. When people open up their doors 
to invite more voices into the room, that diversity of thought is great for the bottom line of, of corporate America, of business. Um, and uh, this is a really, a, what do you call that? A, a um, kind of a, just an example. Uh, I wouldn't call it a cliche. The word is eluding me, but this is a kind of a, kind of a generic example. But uh, when I think of the value of diversity and what it brings to a company, uh, I think a fun metaphor for me to think about is the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Um, because partially because I grew up as a huge comic book fan. And when they started um, really taking comic book movies seriously, I got very excited. Um, and the Marvel Cinematic Universe, I think, it was like a new dawn for, for the genre of comic book films. So, um, you know, if you look at the Marvel Cinematic Universe, uh, the, the first films were uh, Hulk and Iron Man. Great films and, uh, you know, blockbusters, and it kind of started them on this really historic run of movies. Uh, and I, from the, from the moment the first one came out, I was waiting for the black movie to drop, <laughs> you know, it ended up becoming spoiler alert. It was black Panther and it was a hit. Um, but before we got black Panther, you know, there was Iron Man, there was, there was Hulk, you know, two white male protagonists. Uh, then we got Thor. I was still excited at that point. Uh, then we got Iron Man two, we got Thor two, we got Avengers, you know, super group. Um, still overwhelmingly lacking in diversity, but, you know, we're moving in the right direction. And I knew, I just knew the next movie after Avengers was going to be, you know, Black Panther or Falcon or, you know, but no, we, we had, you know, Captain America 2 and 3, Thor 2 and 3, Ant-Man, Doctor Strange, Ant-Man 2, all these movies. There was like 20 movies featuring white heterosexual male leading men and two group flicks uh with nary a, a a sidekick you know you had your nick fury in there you had your you had your auxiliary black characters um but it took like 20 films for us to get black panther and uh and what happened you know when black panther dropped uh it did better than every single one of the movies that came before it. Granted, it was built on the foundations of their success. It was a, it was a phenomenal job that they did being, if you look at numbers for a movie, a superhero movie that stars a single, uh, you know, single hero, and that's not a sequel. It did better than every single movie uh, that, that starred one of these other characters. And of course it did, because, uh, you know, great cast, great writing. It was just a really good film. Black director, the same guy who did Fruitvale Station, um, you know, which was a film about police brutality um, that kind of launched uh, Ryan Coogler and Michael B. Jordan's career. Um, you know, that having those diverse voices in the room enhances the studio. It's a good look for Marvel. They should have done it much sooner. Um, you know, and moving forward, uh, having, uh, the, you know, the, the, the next biggest movie after Black Panther in the Marvel Cinematic Universe outside of Avengers is Captain Marvel, which was another like, why did it take so long to get a female lead, a woman lead in this franchise? Um, you know, and then it outperforms all the guys uh, and is one of the best movies in the, in the franchise. So, I mean, I say that to say it, it's a, it's a, it is an example, it's a reflection of how structural racism works. Um, and, and I don't mean racism as in, uh, I don't mean to conflate that with uh, the violence inflicted upon black bodies in the street. That is also the result of structural racism. Um, and, uh, 
the 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 two systems are are interrelated um you know but really what it's about is is disney wins when uh diversity is at the forefront of their minds from directors from lead actors from stars uh uh producers writers the more diverse those rooms are the better their products are the better their content is, the better the world is. Um, and so I, that's something that, that my dad talked about often too. Um, the, the, his firm was so successful because of the diversity in the room, not just my dad at the head, but he made sure that he put as many women and people of color. So when he's competing with another firm, you know, the way architecture works is you have a client that wants to do a building and they basically do a call for proposals. Um, my proposal that I slap on the table has so much more diversity of thought than your firm that is, you know, 95% folks from one background and lived experience. When they pick this thing up, you know, it smells like gumbo. You know, it doesn't smell like, uh, Oh God, insert generic food place, Shoney's, <laughs> you know, Steam or Olive chicken. Garden. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it smells yeah. like, whoa, what is, what is this? They're tasting flavors that they'd never considered before. This, you know, these, uh, well, what is that place called? I was just there, Sichuan. I was in the Sichuan region of China this time last year. Incredible flavors and spices. They got the Sichuan, they got the fried chicken, they got the, you know, it's a, it's a mix. And that, that mix allows you to take the best flavors of each culture and to present something that's really amazing and different and never been seen before. Um, and that enhances the bottom line of the business or the entrepreneur. It's not, and it's, sir, and it's what's right. Like in addition to being a smart business move, it's the right thing to do. Um, and, but, you know, you only get that flavor, you only get that grit, you only get that sauce when folks who are historically marginalized all of a sudden have agency, have power, have a seat at the table, have an opportunity to weigh in on whatever it is that you're creating. If you're creating policy around police behavior, it will improve that police policy. And guess what? That's gonna to lead to a reduction in crime. Because if people feel like they're being protected, you know, then they're, they're gonna have a different type of relationship with law enforcement. What happens now with the broken window policies is people come in, you know, clubs raised, and they lock people up for silly shit, which gets them caught up in a criminal justice system which is infamous for its recidivism rate. Meaning I may have got locked up for weed, but now that I'm in here and when I get out, I can't get a job because there's a felony I'm record on my, um, you know, my criminal record history. I can't get afford, I don't have access to affordable housing. I can't get that loan that I was hoping for. I don't have access to, uh, you know, any type of social service. Now, what am I, now I don't have an option to do anything but the activity that got me sent there in the first place. That is, that system is designed in a way to, and we know this by looking at the people who are making the policies, it's designed by people who wanna fill prisons up because guess what? The prison industrial complex is an industry, a for-profit industry, and they're not making no profit if there aren't people coming in and out of that system. So, you know, of course, it, it functions in the way that it does at the expense of vulnerable people who don't have the political power to say, maybe we shouldn't do it that way, you know? And so that's why a lot of activists say the system's not actually broken. It's performing at peak efficiency. And cops aren't, uh, there aren't, these aren't bad apples. They're actors that are performing the function that they were designed to perform 
It's just that the designers weren't people that looked like George Floyd and they still aren't. And until they are, it will continue to function in the way that it historically has, uh, which has done an excellent job at protecting white people and white property in this country. Um, though people are, are becoming hip to the fact that that's not a great, that's not a great system. Like th what that leads to is moments like these where people are so fed up with the way things have been that they're going to shut it down rather than let it persist. And that's not a sustainable model. So we better figure something else out. Yeah, no, I agree. I think, I think yeah, I was looking for a word earlier. I still don't know if it is. I was like war of attrition or I think zero sum is sort of the term. It's like, this isn't a zero sum game, you know, moving, you know, moving things into more diversity and inclusivity should not be seen as at the expense of others. Although I feel like that's a common mistake that people make. I feel like even it's, I mean, you know, it, right now it feels like it's even like the people uprising against the system, like the system, bad people, good. Like how do we kind of create that futurism dialogue where it's about the boats, all boats rising, and I think one of the challenges I see in this, if, you know, as we kind of talk as people and potential collaborators, I love the, just the collaborator sort of mindset you have on that through all your different works and, and efforts. And I, I've always kind of, I kind of use that same metaphor too. Like, you know, we're like basically like a jam band, you know, like if someone has an idea, maybe we work on it, maybe we don't, maybe we just do a couple sessions, maybe it goes away, some things stick and they become, becomes, you know, a metaphorical album or song of others don't, they just, their notes. I've got notebooks of notes everywhere here. Mm -hmm. um, but my thoughts kind of quickly go to like, and I think about systems. So I'm like, what's the quantifiable benefit of inclusion and equity? And, you know, you can keep it simple for people because people like simple shit. I mean, there's at least like 50% more customer base. That was the Marvel one, you know, like, mm -hmm. especially if you include, you know, gender equity, obviously. Yeah. I mean, you're great way, way over the 50% mark. So right. I mean, you can kind of ease, use these big whole numbers. I was having another conversation about like, you know, investment funds. If you're returning 20% IRR per year to your fund, you can raise billions of dollars, 20, not a thousand percent. And it's like they, you see these hundred X outcomes or these huge, great deals. That's because that's to make up for all the bad deals. So I'm like, wait, 20% growth each year or return is deemed massively successful and you should repeat that process mm -hmm. wow what a sweet anecdote for inclusivity and diversity like wow like easily 20 percent more 20 percent more customers 20 percent more growth 20 percent more better 20 percent better ideas 50 percent better ideas these are real numbers that beat mm -hmm. the stock market every year i'm just trying to think of how to quantify it the harder one though is like this quantifiable benefit to almost a public good and this is COVID related, but it's also race and George Floyd related too. People don't pay for public goods. That's econ economics. And I forgot all my economics knowledge, but like people don't want, I don't want to pay for a sidewalk. It just exists. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, I don't pay. I mean, I, we do via our taxes, but like, it doesn't have a direct, like, oh, I will give money that like, that's why we don't have like mass and supplies. Cause you're like, well, I don't really think that we should pay for that or whatever, but like not having masks, uh, we should, you know, people aren't like, what can I do? Should I, you know, how active should I be involved in communities and improving uh, this future state where marginalized folks have a seat at the table? Well, if it doesn't directly impact me, it's easy just to get back and I've got my groceries, my budget, my kids, my wife, my business, my employees, like da, da, da. Because I hope someone's doing it, someone else, not me. And that is where it falls into like that public good. But once it's, once it goes bad, there's a huge negative impact about across everybody. There's fear, there's anxiety, there's pain, there's suffering. Mm. How, whatever measure you use to measure anything that's successful, all of those measures are going down. It's too global. I don't know. The mistake or the risk or the challenge as us as people like is like, is it too global? How do we make that global? Like, I want to paint that future where people have awareness and we can quantify. Like, if people's productivity goes down, our businesses suffer. If our mental 
well-being goes down because we're scared for our friends, our loved ones, ourselves. We fucking live here. This sucks, man. Our happiness, our well-being goes down. Our stress goes up. Our ability to be there for our loved ones goes down. The negative impacts and risks to our kids is, is at risk. Like, there's so many things that are side not side effects, primary effects of these rifts and huge gashes in the fabric of our society that are bad without quantifying it. The risk is that we just go to like, there's a protest and there's this, there's this, there's this. Like, but if everyone can kind of like be like, wait a minute, the whole world is better, happier, less suicide, more GDP, like just touch, it touches all the things health equity, you know, socioeconomic equity, GDP. I mean, like this impacts investors and, and Wall Street to use the, op- I mean, not the opposite, but, you know, an extreme thing, like better societies, happier societies, happier people are going to be more productive. We're going to invent science shit faster. We're going to like, the stock market will go up. Like we'll have, we'll be happier. People have better and more healthy relationships. We'll be more fulfilled, you know, like, it's almost like I'm getting goosebumps in a way because I'm like, it, it doesn't feel that big. No one's leveling that message up of like, we all want that, right? Great. So let's debate and discuss how we get there because the same old way, we're only going to have these results that we're, that we keep getting and they're just riff after ri- or rift or I'm trying to get a, a word that's big enough. It's a deep fission in our whole like, you know, tactile or tectonic tectonic plates or whatever you know like each time that happens it just sets everything back it just a big ass thing happens it's like natural disaster after natural disaster we can't sustain that as as a civilization economy society whatever so we got to start saying we've got to you know build these rocket ships and go to mars we have to have this plan to create this new layer uh, on top of you know or at the i guess maybe at the bottom at the foundation of our of our society um to prevent that. And to me, and I'm not just a numbers guy, I kind of like, I totally believe in the power of story, but I want that story, that North pole, that North star, I should say, the compass to be like that other side. Yeah. And Cause that other side, the future future is it's all good, you know? And, and these are steps, there's gonna be painful steps now that we want to take, but just cause it's painful for somebody, I want to have be armed with the ability to say this might suck, but look at where we're going. It's not a zero sum game. I didn't just take something from you. I'm at, we are we are together, adding to a bigger a bigger pie and a better world and a, a rising tide. I don't know. I think you want to comment on that at all, or is that? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, just one quick thought. Um, my thoughts are never quick. Let me go ahead and <laughs> let this claimer out the window. But I, I would say that you know one of the key elements is is that there are people that benefit from the system as it currently exists and and whatever we can do to de-incentivize the status quo i think will help us move more swiftly to to another direction so uh, there are two or three meta like stories that pop in my head one of them is like a system of enslavement so obviously like this country was built on slavery and there were a lot of people who who were dreading the end of that institution because they had a lot to lose uh, and they didn't know how that you know how they were going to continue a business model for themselves in a in a new paradigm and so uh you know so there, there are losers and people who gain from the system as it exists another thing i'm a big star trek fan there was an episode that i watched the other night Star Trek Voyager. I'm a next generation guy, but Voyager is also very good. Um, It was about um, this, basically this uh, alien species that was uh, dumping this toxic material in this part of the universe that was uh, causing genocide on this really unique species um, of alien. Uh, But anyway, the, 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 the Starfleet crew was like, oh, we have a system that can allow you to dispose of your waste in a way where you can turn it into more energy. But the the industry of waste disposal people ended up going to war with them because they were like, you know what, that's a great idea. And yeah, that would create not only help us clean up our planet 
but uh because you know they, they were breathing through these breathing tubes and stuff they just looked like these yeah. disgusting creatures but they were like but uh this is like the biggest industry in our planet is waste removal that's how billions of dollars are made and you need to de-incentivize folks who stand to win from the current system that's why it was so radical and this did not come from obama it came from organizers who are telling the federal government what they wanted because it's the people at the bottom who have the best ideas for policy solutions but when obama said uh no more private prisons in the federal uh uh system what that did was it it's it's taking something that should not be for profit and is problematically for profit and and saying we're we're going to we're going to take that potential benefit in terms of donor dollars or whatever existing infrastructure but a harmful infrastructure like a leech like the prison system the slavery system those things yeah they pour a lot of money into the pockets of a lot of politicians they do a lot of business they create a lot of jobs correctional officers and you know it's a big part of our economy but it's a bad part of our economy they need to find something else to do with their time and 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 it's hard to create it so i don't even know if it's a zero-sum game game because there are people who benefit from the current system so it's a, it's a legit question. What is the correctional officer going to do? What is the former, you know, to extend the metaphor, what is the former plantation owner or uh, overseer going to do in the new system? Because if they can't see it, they're going to die for the status quo to continue. Um, and it's going to be a battle between the overseers and the people who are under their boot. And that's what you see playing out in law enforcement right now. What are we going to do? People are calling to defund the police. The people who, who have, are waiting on their pension a couple years from their pension uh, after uh, protecting and serving to the best of their ability for 20 years are like, well, I don't like that plan. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. How do we create but here's the thing, like, but we also know, but, but your system hasn't been working out too well for us. So we don't trust you to continue making those decisions, you know, but that's a scary prospect for folks. So it, that, that's where it becomes, you know, a tough negotiating process, um, you know, and, and again, it's in law enforcement, but also like oil, you know what I mean? Like yeah. solar sounds great. Renewable energy sounds great to everybody, but the people trying to build a, the ACC, you know, pipeline, you know, through the marshes and protected environments of our state. So like those are conflicting interests. It's not just like everything's going to be kumbaya when energy is free because we're capturing it from the sun. How do you think Duke Energy feels about that? They make billions of dollars uh, selling us. That's why they don't let you put solar panels on your roof uh in this state or they make it very difficult you know so it, we have to fight it's not going to be something that they're willing to just hand over um because there's money involved and people are greedy and and uh, i know we're coming probably coming close to the end of our conversation and i don't want to end on a bad note but it's 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 important to realize that people have vested interest in perpetuating the status quo um oh 100 percent yeah and, i mean so like yeah that that's part of the solution is figuring out, you know, how to navigate and negotiate those conflicting interests with the, as you, I think you pointed this out, you, you said you alluded to it with one of your statements around, I don't know, the, the word that I comes to mind for me is like a triple bottom line because people still got to make money and got to eat and got to live. But what is the social impact? What is the environmental impact? Those things, those things should be more important than they are in the grand scheme, in the balancing act of trying to figure out how to grow sustainably. And the current system we have is not sustainable. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, this, this materializes or manifests, I guess, all over 
you know, the, that the incumbent thing and, and the Duke energy, let's take that like, well, we or the, the oil people like, you know, they don't, I mean, they've invested, you know, billions and billions of all these workers and technology and groundwork so that they could produce oil because that's a business that they're in. If that was just shut off or deemed unnecessary tomorrow, that might be scary for many businesses who would say, well, why would I invest in my own infrastructure to make a car if eventually cars are just immediately legislated out? I need to protect my interests. But that doesn't mean that we should accept the kind of incumbent sort of mindset you know and like that incumbent mindset blocks many things that are innovative i mean it, even if we're considering this an innovation in the way our, our social justice fabric right we're trying to get out of the you know incumbent mindset i don't that's not i not that's not to like uh, like kind of marginalize that piece but i'm just you know analogous to other areas that that income in mind pieces their mindset is like is bad it's unproductive it's counterproductive mm. it doesn't mean again it doesn't mean it's all or nothing i'd love you know and going back to the gary v not to bounce around but i was thinking about this too i was like man you know gary v talks about like the the reverse funnel so like your pillar content i'm gonna turn this into 64 pieces of content too hashtag gary v kidding <laughs> uh, but like you know like this whole next level this i do this could be a collaboration too but like but the top of that funnel is the pillar, which is like the future future is this happier place. There's more equity. There's more, you know, productivity, happiness, wellness. Everything is better from health to social to socioeconomic to GDP to business interests to like our relations with the world, all that shit. You know, at the bottom is what we're dealing with now, which is bad. And then like, how do we identify each of these big blockers? Um, you know, we can't just say, hey, our country's like gone like this up and to the right and then kind of like completely ignore these huge dips. Like, yeah, we, we made, you know, we made a, you know, um, I don't know, $500 million um, a year each year. And then like, oh, that month we lost 6 trillion. Like you can't ignore that, right? So when you average this out, we haven't been doing so well. Mm -hmm. So we can't just say everything's great, everything's great. Like, no, 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 we've got these massive things, a housing crisis. COVID now, I mean, I don't know how this will historically be viewed, but I think there's equal, if not more so, greater short-term and long-term um, relevance to the George Floyd situation and others, but that is a, a, a stark example that's in front of everybody that's a, a you know, call to action. Um, you know, we can't just say, like, oh, once you take these little huge issues out, it's all good. Like, no, averaged in, it's kind of not all good. So we're going yeah. to this other big place at the top of the funnel, correctional systems, judicial systems, educational systems, policing systems, all these things are like points that need to be unblocked. And mm -hmm. below that is all these people that need to be to weigh in on it, or all these decisions that need to be made or all the conversations that need to be had. There's something to that because like, uh, there's someone above each of those levels, right? So like, yeah. you know, where does the judicial system money go well i don't know i mean we just spent six fucking trillion dollars so like can't we use some of that to like repurpose that to be like a you know solar powered grow house for veggies right. like you know and like we're talking about retraining but it's usually like oh because tech is going to displace a trucker like well i mean you know we can do retraining like that's okay now we're investing can we take some of the six trillion that we just spent because of what, like our lack of resilience and preparedness to like say let's invest that forward to training the metaphorical correctional officer to be a solar you know grow house manager or right. could we could they be a you know community advocate or could they be a something that you know has i was going to say equal if not more productivity it's hard to say that that's a productive role now but so it'd be not hard to say they're going to be equally if not more productive well um, yeah I'm, i i don't know I'm, i think it is productive it's productive to <laughs> to the prison industrial complex uh, yep, yep, yep. And, and making money off of uh, black bodies. One thing I, I do want to say, though, um, you mentioned George Floyd a couple times. Um, I think you said situation. You, you said death earlier, George Floyd death. Um, I think that it, it, I meant to speak on this, but then I didn't I remember because I was answering a question. But, you know, words create worlds. They're really important. Um, I, when I hear George Floyd, the, the word that comes next isn't death or situation, is murder. You know, like we saw it on tape. 
And I think words are really important to be intentional about. Um, so anyway, I, I offer that as a gift, not to put words Please, in your yeah, mouth, thank you. but, to, but I've heard you use different words. And so uh, if you haven't had a chance to think about how you would articulate that um, intentionally, because uh, you know, when you're fishing for words, it is hard to wrap your mind around how complicated it is. But uh, the, the, for me, when I hear the George, George Floyd, it's murder yeah. <laughs> is, is the next word. Um, no, so I, I just wanted to, I just wanted to offer that to you as a, as a reflection, as I've heard you kind of choose and, and think through different ways to articulate what is the George Floyd thing. Yeah, you know, that's right. No, thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, and I, I, you know, I think that's important for us all to be intentional with that. And even as a society, use our words and like, because I have thought a lot about that, like murder, uh, that is, you know, emotive and that, that signals the, the, the gravity of the situation. When I'm kind of thinking of words, it's like, what about the fact that it's a, it's a signal, you know, it's a, is it a signal? Is it a movement? Is it a, is it a, it's a shining light on the problems and things that are broken. Um, there are lots of, you know, I'm not a lyricist, but like, yeah, <laughs> words are always going through my mind that are, that are different, but they do have meaning. And I like, you know, the more we can all communicate about things like this, I mean, shoot, language, I mean, language and communication is important in all aspects of life and having being on the same page and being able to know what, what we're saying and, and it impacts greatly our ability to communicate. Sure. Um, so I, I do, I do agree and appreciate that, that sentiment and that, uh, reflection, you know, constructively, which is, thank you, um, for making space for that. Um, yeah, we are kind of wrapping up and I, so what are a, well, actually on a tactical thing, you know, our building is pretty empty right now. So if there's any kind of things that you want to hear, I mean, we, we use space sort of like, kind of like metaphorically, a lot of times we've got the space for the space. If you need like actual space for stuff, um, for any of the efforts you're working on, uh, or if any of these things kind of spark any interesting um, collaborations, definitely let me know. Um, but yeah, I mean, how, how do you want to wrap this up? What do you, you know, what's something that we can work on together if this was just Nick and Pierce saying, hey, we've got some time as we're in this space together where we're trying to figure out what's next. We know that big North Star, uh, but you know, we're, we're looking at our compass and we're kind of like, is this the right way? Cause it looks cloudy, you know, or yeah. I see a storm brewing. Like, is it, is that telling me the right thing? Like, you know, right. what should we do as, uh, as, as shipmates? Um, you know, yeah, I think, you know, if I were to, uh, well, there are a couple things that there are some, there's some very practical things that I've been hearing. And again, this isn't me. This, this is what I'm hearing from grassroots organizers the 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 movement workers and the and the change shapers that are hitting the streets um they're talking about resources um you know one of the biggest privileges that um uh you know that folks who are able can offer to um the grassroots organizers is resources money you know find a dozen black led queer led you know organizing group bodies and, and give them money so that they can continue to fuel the creative process that is going to result in, you, you know, you may not care much about what happens with the sidewalks or the police, but they're gonna be there at the city council meeting raising hell. Um, and if they can, if they can uh, do that work as their primary work and not as like, I'm working Walmart 10 hours a day and I'm doing my organizing work in the evenings because you know that's the reality of my situation being able to lift them out of Walmart and and to put them squarely in that work of of doing the uh you know doing that work that people you know may or may not be equipped to do or know how to do there are people that are equipped that are trained uh, and they're organizers um Black Youth Project 100 uh, Southerners on New Ground, Spirit House, Durham, 
you're talking, we talked earlier about where I got my sauce from. It, it's the local organizing community in Durham. It is so strong. It is unlike many places in this country and in this world and how many black, queer, you know, historic, there's the Durham Committee on the Affairs of Black People, there's, you know, the Pinhook and North Star Church of the Arts, Black Space, you know, Black August in the Park, uh, you know, so many cultural and political institutions that could use resources. So that's one thing. Um, but not everybody has resources to give. And here's my other thing that I would want to close on in terms of advice. And this relates back to the compass. Um, there's a rapper named Immortal Technique who says, no person can do everything, but everyone can do something. And so you don't need to do everything. You don't necessarily need to be out there in the streets. You don't necessarily need to be donating money, but there is something that you can do. Um, and uh, I saw a, a video clip this morning of a kid on Instagram arguing with her parents. Um, uh, her parents are basically saying, oh, you know, all those black folks in the ghetto, they don't give a shit. All they do is collect their welfare check and blah, blah, you know, and she was standing up to her parents. There's a kid who looked like she may have been 15 years old. You know, she can't change the world, but she can have a position, she can have a conversation, a very frank conversation and a very spirited and uncompromising converse conversation with her racist ass parents. You know, that's something every one of us can do. You can call your grandpa or your parent or your family, or your cousin or your friend that you play basketball. You can have a conversation with those people, you know, and, and for entrepreneurs, I think the, the, the way for me, at least the way I find my North star is, you know, it's not like, or do you, let's go back to my dad, for example, it's not like the casino offer comes or the prison offer comes and you're like, stiff arm, I'm good. That's not aligned with my vision. You think about it. You say, wow, this could allow me to expand my, here's the opportunity cost here. Here are the pros, here are the cons. If the cons outweigh the pros, it's gotta go. But that's a process, it's a process. And the more that we do intentional reflection, and for me that comes in the practice of meditation, the more you can come into tune with the sensitivity of your compass. All the compass does is tell you where the northern magnetic pole of the earth is. You know, and some devices, some tools are more sensitive than others. You can put a leaf in a pool of still water, you know, and rub a, you know, a, a piece of metal against some fabric and that'll give you a compass but then there are tools that are even more specific so for me fine tuning the compass comes through meditation quiet every day turning off the noise of your phone and social media and your friends that allows you to look internally to find out what's really going what, what can i do and and i bet if you really take the time to ask yourself that question, you will get a plethora of answers. What, what, what might start as, oh, I don't know what to do. This looks like a big storm coming and I don't know how to deal with it. If you sit in that storm and, and you breathe, you, you'll find out something, maybe something small, but like a moral technique said, you don't have to do everything, but everyone can do something. You can start, here's a small thing that just popped in my head. There's a, a, a new black owned CSA called tall grass um, foods. I think it's tall grass foods. But th these are people who go out and collect fresh farm to table food from black only farmers. You know, that's not uh, changing our criminal justice system. But what it is, is, is putting money in the hands of rural black farmers. There's a start. There's something you could do. Listeners, go do that. You that's know, right. that's something you can do. So, so, so the key is to not be overwhelmed by the gravity of our situation and to not feel like just because everybody else is in the streets, that's what the fuck you need to be doing. Excuse my French. You can bleep me out later. You don't need to be doing what everybody else is doing. You need to be doing the thing that is uniquely aligned with your capacity. 
and uniquely aligned with the world that you want to shape for yourself and as an extension that has an impact on others. So, you know, you're talking about being healthy, working out, you know, how can you work out and be healthy in a way you can go to, um, Oh, what's it? I think it's called 360 fitness. There's a black queer owned personal trainer in downtown Durham. You can get food from a, a, a black owned CSA instead of giving your money to Amazon at Whole Foods every week. You know, that's a way for you to support black entrepreneurship uh, you know, and again, and you know, you're not sitting at city hall cussing out the police chief, you know, you're, you're finding ways that like we talked about with having diverse folks in the room that allow you to level up in the way that enhances your quality of life while pouring your, uh, you know, capital into businesses that are ultimately going to, to benefit the black community as a whole. You know what I mean? Yep. That doesn't make you, you know, philanthropy number one, but it allows you to spend money that you would already have been spending to Amazon, to Bezos. You know, you can give that to the local local black farmers and that'll have an impact. So anyway, that's like one example, a very uh, cliche kind of simple, it, it, it goes deeper from there. So level one, chakra level one is support a black CSA or personal trainer. You know, imagine how deep you can go if you keep uh, if you keep your your compass open through kind of reflection and meditation. At least that that's my tool. There may be other tools out there for others, but for me, that's yeah. my tool. Yeah. And if there's anything you you want to work on together, I love some of the ideas around sort of the the, the storytelling, the reverse funnel. Um, we can, you know, I'm always available to 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 get together or virtually whatever but yeah i would I love that you. thank you thank you for reaching back out it's been a while and I, I remember coming by your office and joan was great and the event that we did at the um at the rick house was was amazing and we appreciated yep. your support then but uh, i'm glad that you thought to reach back out and it's good to reconnect I, i'll definitely keep my ears and mind open and we'll call on you if i have any ideas same for you, if you awesome yeah, we'll do we'll do Cool. Well, I appreciate your time, man. Have a great right. rest of the day and uh, have a good weekend. All right. Later. Later.